And if I ask the AI to just verify every single one of my articles or uh, my emails, they would always be very neutral and so very boring in a way. And you have like control, entry, then you have need. So there must be a need. And then there is scale and time. And the thing is that when all these startups, they had two main problems. The first was the control. So they, they completely delegated their control to open AI. So basically, if they want to shut down the API tomorrow, uh, all these startups just cease to exist. Like, like Thanos, it's, it's over. This is Louis from What's AI, and here's the second episode I received Jeremy Cohen, founder of Think Autonomous, a platform to learn about autonomous vehicles, and he also has a daily newsletter sharing lots of insights about AI, your career, self-driving cars, and more. The format of this episode is a bit special. Here, I highlighted a dozen of questions and debate to talk about artificial intelligence in general. So you will learn a lot of cool things related to ChatGPT, artificial intelligence, the future of your own job, how to stay relevant in the AI era, how to cope with hallucinations, and more. I'm sure you'll love this episode. If you do, please don't forget to leave a like and a five-star review depending on where you are listening to this episode. Thank you for watching. How did you get into the field and what are you doing now? I got into the field by accident, actually. Um, I got a diploma in engineering and it was IoT, so Internet of Things. So everything smart, connected objects. In 2017, 2016, that was like super hypey. And, and so I worked on that and I had an internship in a consulting company doing... Uh, that they told me like we have a mission on smart. Uh, I think it was like fire alarms or something like that in the house, and so that was perfect for me. I just wanted to go and, and try my Bluetooth skills on that, and and the problem was that the mission failed or there was something like the client decided that we were not a good fit. Uh, so we were an entire team, and so I got uh, I got out of this project after like only a month and they told me, okay, so we don't have anything IoT for now, but we have an AI mission coming and it's going to be with a bank and you're going to classify banking emails. And that was something like, I had no idea what it would be about. The idea was that the bank is doing some chatbot. And so when you are stuck abroad, you have your credit card blocked or something like that, you just, uh, send an email to a chatbot or send a chat and then they, they unlock the card or something like that. And so that was the discovery of AI. And then like a few years in the future, I, I kept learning about AI. I learned more about how to fuse AI with IoT. And I found that the best fusion of that was robotics and self-driving cars because it's like a physical thing, yet there is still the physical and the intelligence. And so I, I started working on the idea of becoming a self-driving car engineer. And in a nutshell, I became a self-driving car engineer. And I worked on autonomous shuttles for a couple of years. Um, I worked on computer vision as well. And today I'm... Um, I built a company that's helping engineers and companies build self-driving cars. So helping engineers mean mostly helping them becoming a self-driving car engineer. I have a daily newsletter that people read. We have over 10,000 engineers inside. And there is um, the companies who also need help building their own algorithms. And so uh, we also do that. So that, that's the introduction in short. And uh, yeah. Awesome. So maybe we can start with the, the topic that I have related to your, your expertise. And it's, are autonomous vehicles really the solution to our current transportation issues in, in the various countries? Okay, so um, I think not necessarily. Uh, when I started with autonomous vehicles, the promise was that it would solve the accident problem and it will solve the traffic congestion problem and, um, and, and the pollution as well. And so everything that derives from that. Today, so several years later, I would say the accident probably, um, it's probably a good solution when you have like these ADAS features and uh, emergency braking. We saw how it helps and how it will keep helping. Um, but I don't think like I, I, I got into several um, 
autonomous vehicles, including when back in January I was in San Francisco, so I could experiment with a lot of these uh, opening. Uh, they were they were driving completely in the open, and, and I, I noticed that it does not necessarily reduce traffic. It's just another car. Uh, there is not this idea of having the car better or Oh, so maybe the accident, the reduction of accidents will decrease traffic, but there is still the congestion problem. I don't see it solved by self-driving car. I would see it solved by uh, better infrastructure inside cities, probably. Subways, but, but better, you know, yeah. s- stuff like that. Work on that. Most more work on that would be probably better. What do you think? Well, if all cars are autonomous, wouldn't that solve traffic? Like it would be super efficient and optimized, I guess that... So maybe if we have lanes where it's only autonomous, you know, when we have bus lanes, we would have bus plus self-driving or just self-driving lanes, maybe. But it would mean there is some sort of entity that controls traffic, you know, when they do with reinforcement learning games. I don't see that happening. And still, like, that would be decades in the future. Like, we're talking... Like if I buy a car now, which like people still buy cars today by a lot, and it's not autonomous, most some people are going to keep it for like four mm. years. So they are still going to be here uh, four years in the future, uh, unless they're banned or something. But that's the idea. But do you th- do you never see this happen, or just like in a very long time? I don't particularly see it happening yet. I, I think. A 100% autonomous world, I think it would be difficult to achieve. Uh, people like to have control and to drive. Um, they, they, there would be some uh, work to do on that. But even there, I think autonomous vehicles should be, it, it should be like a solution that is offered that is better and that most people take, uh, you know, like people sometimes today, they take a subway mm. to get to work and they don't take their car because it's just too much problem. And that would be the same kind of deal. Yeah. Like if you take the autonomous road, it's much fa- faster. Uh, you have no traffic light, you have no pedestrian, you just drive and you're, you're home in fift- 15 minutes. And otherwise you can take your car, but you will be in traffic, you will have these issues, you will have these regulations, you can get into accidents, you can get uh, into all of that. Maybe it will be more expensive with the insurance. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so but that would still be an option, I think. So why are companies still working on autonomous vehicles, do you think? Like, because that, that's that's a solution we need. That's something that we want. Like this idea of the, the additional lane, uh, that's incredible. Yeah. If everybody, like if we have a city where we have maybe... Uh, a part that is designed for walking and a part that is designed for cyclists and another for autonomous vehicles. And then the rest is just uh, a few vehicle roads here and there, but most of the city, maybe cities would be autonomous and outside yeah. not much, you know, something like that. People think it's the opposite. I would say it more like that. I think in Paris, in Paris, we have entire roads forbidden to cars. Mm. Like, uh, even like boulevard and stuff like that, completely forbidden to cars. Now we either walk or cycle or maybe just have buses. Yeah. And that would be maybe autonomous vehicles inside of that too. Yeah, I see it. Much more promising for like larger transportations, like like autonomous buses, for example, compared to just a, a bunch of autonomous, autonomous cars, I guess. Or like shuttles or yeah. things like that. Yeah. And trucking, like all these repetitive uh, um, things, like trucking is really tiring for people. Like uh, we can talk about job loss, but they, they also, this is, this is not jobs that they particularly like. Um, I don't think I'm wrong here. Like many complain every day, they have shorter lifespan, all of that. So uh, yeah, that, there is that too. Yeah, perfect. Let's jump into the second one. So are AI startups dead? Okay, so you mean after the open AI? Yeah, update? well, like, obviously this has changed, but also just in general, because there are so many, st- like, like I, can gi- I can start giving my opinion. Um, yeah. Basically, there are so many startups, and I would assume like the vast majority of them are based directly on, on open AI products. 
or, or like Claude or, mm -hmm. or some other large language models. And with very little innovation, I guess that's, of, of course, some of them build like nice products around them and they can uh, be a bit different in, in what they, they bring to the table other than just prompting the LLM. But I feel like there may be still a lot of money in the, in the AI startup space, but it may lead to some kind of other like AI winter where all this this invested money basically is for almost nothing because like OpenAI can release whatever a good a, comp a successful company b has built, but directly on their platform since they are so re uh, uh, dependent on OpenAI. So I, I'm just afraid that like right now, I, I feel like it's a bit discouraging to start a new product or project, especially when if it's related to artificial intelligence, just because now I feel like more than ever, um, bigger companies with more budget can very quickly uh, erase you. So I think when you say AI startups dead, um, we, we could define an AI startup. If it's just calling an API, is it really an AI startup or is it a PDF uh, GPT startup? And and that, these are different. Um, I actually wrote about this in from my daily emails. Uh, I think it was a week ago or two weeks ago. And, and the gist of, of my answer was that uh, it was based from a book from MJ DiMarco. Uh, I don't know if you've read it, The Millionaire Fast Lane. It's one of the books that got me to start into entrepreneurship. And Basically, it was it was talking about five pillars to 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 build a startup or, or to build a to 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 make it on your own. I would say, and you have like um, control entry. Uh, so control means you need to have control over what you're doing. Entry is about the entry barrier. It should be low enough so um, you can do it, but high enough so not everybody else can do it. Then you have need. So there must be a need. And then there is scale and time. And the thing is that when all these startups, um, they had two main problems. The first was the control. So they, they completely uh, delegated their control to uh, open AI. So basically, if they want to shut down the API tomorrow, uh, all these startups just cease to exist, like like Thanos. It's, mm. it's over. Um, and, and so that, that would be... The first thing is control. So if you have something that relies on GPT, but if GPT breaks, you have BARD. And if BARD breaks, you have another yeah. one. And you also have a lighter custom model in case everybody else decides not to sell anymore. Maybe that's more robust. Um, now, based on that, you also have the idea of need. And the need here was completely destroyed when they added the feature to their own um, platform. But the thing is, um, when you look at, for example, iPhone, and you, you had at some point in the App Store, uh, many apps for portrait modes. So stuff like that's going to do image segmentation and then blur the background. And then that's it. They just blur the background. And that gives you a nice, um, what they call bouquet, I think, uh, portrait mode in the picture. And, and and at some point, Apple released a, a new feature in their phone with the portrait mode and then the cinematic mode. And all of these uh, companies, they either had to adapt and to change their offer or they just died uh, or became free for the existing customers. And, and I think it, it's more related to that. So if you have something that is a need that another company can easily solve, and at the same time, your entire point is dependent. So you have dependency on another thing that can kill your control. Then you just, you don't really have a, a sustainable startup. You have something that is very short term that can make some money at the beginning. At the same time, that is, it's, it's actually slow and long to generate the first customer and get money. And by the time you have something, it can die overnight. So uh, I, I would say that's my answer. I think it's just because, especially on uh, Product Hunt and on LinkedIn, I see a lot of like new products being released where, as someone in the field, I clearly see that it's literally just prompting GPT-4. <laughs> and I, I just wonder if this is hurting our field that so many, tr so many people try to create something like super quickly and they all uh, go bankrupt, basically. And so is this 
like can this hurt the the like economy in the AI field where like it's it um we lose credit like as AI researchers or as like people in the field we we lose credit that AI is, is actually either like not really useful in the end or that you it, it rather go for directly open AI than trusting someone independent it's more like I think if if people uh, build startups so easily and so fast and they die so easily and so fast, it, it could happen in any yeah. field. It's more like there is a hype around it and just everybody goes there and a lot of people lose their money and their time and um, and, and that's kind of it. It's more like th that could that, that happen in a, in a way in crypto and in Web3 where we have like this, this thing where suddenly everybody had a web free startup and we don't really hear these people anymore. Uh, some of them could still be working on the mission, but they realize that it's a 10 year thing. It's not a, a one month thing. It's more like, okay, so if we want to last in this thing, we're going to have to build customers, build trust, build great product, blah, blah, blah. So, um, it doesn't hurt credibility or anything. It's more like, there has been a gold rush and people try to get in and then, and it happened also with self-driving cars. Like when I joined the self-driving car world, we were tens of thousands to join at the same time. And, and then we had a lot of startup dying, a uh, lot of people like just no longer working on self-driving cars. They decided it was too hard. And then we have the, the people that stayed uh, that just keep building stuff, improving it. And then at some point it's going to become mainstream. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so my next one is somewhat different, and it's about the, well, it's not even recent anymore in our field, but the AI pause that was suggested. And and so the, the question or, or debate is that, like, should the AI research focus on progress and improving or on a better control and understanding of the, like, algorithm or whatever we are building? That's, that's a tough question, uh, especially since uh, I don't personally know people who build, who build large language models like that or who have this uh, big control because mostly it's like, I think it's like a few companies that run the entire thing, right? Even the other startups are acquired. So should they focus on progress? It's not progress. It's more like... Um, competition and if they don't do it somebody else will so they have to do it and control is like how can they do it but it doesn't cause trouble i don't know what do you think uh i think it's like two-sided basically i agree with you for the companies they they don't really have a choice they they need to to improve and to to go forward and just yeah, always get better results. But at the same time, I think that it's uh, the government's role to invest way more in having like the best AI researchers and uh, more technical people to like quickly iterate and build better laws and like force the companies to in some way to ensure that like their model act a certain way or like all, all, all this stuff i think it's more from the the government side that needs to to mm -hmm. invest more and to control more and yeah. like that i think would would make a, a good balance between the two so why are they not doing it because it, it seems obvious that government should get involved and say and, and start giving regulations so is it because it's super slow to create regulations or or do they just not want to get there because there is something else that they don't, uh, that we don't suspect at our level? Yeah, I don't have the answer, but I guess it's just always extremely slow. It's, it, it always has been. And in the opposite, I think AI is changing like faster than anything we've ever seen. So it we, yeah. we see it even more now. And I feel like it's it's time for a change. Like it's now more important than ever that that the government changes and and act uh, in more in a more agile way, <laughs> and and act at, like companies like uh, like in the worst case, creating uh, 
laws that are too restrictive and then changing them rather than like waiting mm. and analyzing and in the end creating some law. Plus just for them, keeping up to date with what's happening yeah. is very difficult. Uh, I think they hire people, but still it's like j just understanding how it works um, because you need to understand how it works to put regulations mm. on that. Otherwise, it's very complicated because you get answers and you don't understand them. Uh, why cannot we do that? Because it works like that and it's not the way it has been built and it's an entire uh, issue. Yeah, yeah, I think not just the technical people within the government, but also the the people making decisions also need to understand that. And I guess that they are not like putting in the effort to understand a bit of how it works, like not the te technical parts, but at least like have a broad understanding of the current algorithms or, or things like basically understand that it generates one word after the other or just like to, to understand why yeah. hallucinations happen and what's what is it really doing so that they have a clear idea of the, the fear that they should have and the, the ones that they should not have. All right, so the the next one is, can AI replace experts? I, I would say it depends on how you use uh, the, the purpose of, of, of being yourself an expert and of um, what kind of value you add. Um, for example, if if I, I I write blog a lot of blog posts on autonomous driving, uh, I write about Tesla, about lane detection, about a lot of stuff. Recently, I wrote a blog post about Tesla in their end-to-end -end learning system that they will put in the next uh, FSD software. And if I do that with an AI, I would just ask for tell me ChatGPT. How does Tesla's FSD 12 work? And then they just share it end to end. I'll write an article about that. And I would get what I call the fact. And if an expert gives you just the fact, you don't need the expert if you have ChatGPT. The thing that they are supposed to add is what I also try to add in my articles is like, you don't just come in my articles for the fact. You come because you know it's going to start with a story. Um, it's going to have a lot of metaphors. You're going to have personal experiences with the technology. You're going to have other involvement, such as video from other startups applying the technology. Um, you're going to have uh, maybe some analysis of job offers related to end-to-end -to -end learning. So it's going to be much more than just an article. It's going to be an experience. I think I see it that way. Maybe other people don't, but I, I try to make it that way. And if you call an expert and you say, hey, should I take paracetamol with this medicine? Then maybe at some point you can look it up on Google and just have the answer. And you still need a doctor to do it. Like today, for example, we still trust the doctors to tell us. Even though we have Google, we don't really naturally just go to Google when we have a medical question. At least I don't. I don't know about you, but um, I have a two-year-old uh, baby and basically every time I have a question, I prefer to ask the, the competent human. And even if the AI was competent, I would not necessarily trust it or take the decision on my own. So the experts in, in certain fields like medicine could still be uh, good. In other fields, maybe we just don't want just an expert as an expert. We want an expert as someone who can also give us recommendation, mm. uh, give us examples, assist us, follow us along with the process when we are implementing something, uh, all of that. And what do you think if we like hyper-personalize the artificial intelligence or even if it impersonate someone like that, would this change anything? I still don't think it's going to work. I think we are built to trust humans and to, to talk with humans. And I think it can be a great Wikipedia uh, replacement or great stuff to learn stuff or to validate some answers, to rewrite some things. Sometimes I, I try to write stories for my emails and I don't have a lot of vocabulary in English, yeah. right? I'm not a non-native English speaker, so I cannot describe my room the way an AI would um, or just a novel would. 
And so in this sense, it can be yeah. useful, it can be great. I don't think, I don't think it, we should trust it to, or, or use it to the point where we just have conversations with AI as in the movie, you know, like there is a movie where the guy falls in love with an AI, uh, her, I think, or something like that. Uh, I, I don't think we can get to, to that or we should get to that. And so should people be worried about losing they, their job to an AI? If their job does not necessarily add value or value that cannot be easily automated, uh, yes, they should be worried because uh, we today build cars through automated factories with robots. And that's how cars are built today. We don't have uh, a million people going somewhere in a factory and manually assembling stuff. And, 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 and fortunately, we don't have that today. And, and I think we will say that in the future for other similar jobs. Like, fortunately, we don't have to, to make people just drive thousands of kilometers every single day uh, just to deliver some stuff. Uh, fortunately, we can have a self-driving car doing it. And, and, and that can be the, the same for many things. And for the others, like, we want to focus on humans. Would you have, not a tip, but any insights for anyone regardless of their role to study or like figure out if they are replaceable or not? Oh, that's a great question. Um, first, we, we can look at, at your job. Like, is it, um, is it something that only you can do or something that anybody could do? So that, that's an important question first. Uh, I have a friend who's like, a surgeon in uh, heart surgery. And so not everybody can do that. And um, and if we have experts, robots doing it, it's not going to be for a lot of cases. Maybe they're going to be assistant in that. They, are, they already use assistants for robots for that. So that's already impressive, uh, but, but it's not easily replaceable. Um, accounting, can be easily replaceable up to the point where you need advice and then you need to ask someone. Um, I, for think autonomous, the accountability is, uh, is digital. We have a, I just have a software. It's online. It's easy. There, there is not much to do. Um, I would not trust someone to do it if he had just the, the old paper and then I have to send him the invoices by mail or something like that. Um, so if you are an accountant and you're watching this, go into the idea of giving advice because no AI will give you advice like you would with experiences, with personal connections, with negotiation, with stories, with that. Um, if you are an engineer and you are writing code, I don't think that's easily replaceable for now. Even if AI writes code, we did not shift overnight to a world where now code is written mm -hmm. by AI. We have humans using AI, and even there it doesn't work. And if it works, they still validate it with other people, and it has to be coded a specific way. So um, I would not say, uh, I would say the jobs that are threatened by AI are the jobs that are either easy to do uh, or very, very repetitive. Something like, dashboard or stuff like um, summarizing uh, a discussion. We could summarize a discussion with AI and you would no longer need the scribe doing it or uh, if, if that even, even exists in startups. But you get the point. Like Everything that is easy or repetitive or that requires you to just do the same thing over and over and over again. And in the worst case, my, my opinion is that most people are not replaceable. They just need to learn to leverage the new tools that are now mostly AI like built, AI based. And as long as you keep up with the the new tools and how to make yourself like more efficient or just improve the quality of your work through AI or or whatever tool set that you can have, I think you will keep your job. It's just like a, an accountant, as you said prior internet versus after like it's you will definitely take the one that uses internet even though they were not using it before they just adapted and and learned a new tool now the tools are just 
AI based. So I guess like staying up to date and just just have a bit of interest into what's being done and being willing to learn and to try out new tools, new new apps is super relevant or just taking also like there are i think most big companies do that but you can take for me uh, online formations and and just keep learning i guess that now the best kind of formations you can take is about new technologies to, to just like try to understand them and to to at least start thinking of like what in your current job could be done either automatically or like more efficiently through using artificial intelligence. Yeah, and, and I would say, I don't know if you like cooking, but I, I recently noticed that there are still a lot of cooking books out there being produced, like every year. Um, there are tons of books about uh, how to cook for vegan, how to cook for that and that and that. And even though there are thousands, there are still hundreds more every year. Um, it's not because it's not because we lack recipes. It, it, there is no lack of recipe. We just want the angle of the people who are writing these books. We just like this chef and this type of thing. And and if you ask an AI, can you write a recipe in the in the style of that? And that would just not work. We would still buy the book and we would prefer that. So it's important to understand that. I think that's an opinion, but we don't build AI to replace us uh, everywhere. We build it to replace us where um, it's 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 too repetitive for us to do something, or it's costly, or it's not uh, funny to do. Or <clears throat> we, we saw it with AI generation for images before, like at the beginning of my. You can actually see it today on my website. You have like some courses that have been built, uh, the, the illustration by a designer, some by AI, and some by the pre-AI world when I was buying stock pictures and I would pay like 20, 30, 50 bucks for just a single picture. And that was quite ugly now that I look at it. I'm saying, wow, do I really still have that on my website? And, and, and so all these people who are buying stock pictures, well, now it's going to be complicated to sell stock pictures because if you want a picture of a road, you don't need to pay 50 bucks to get it. You can just generate it. Um, so the, 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 I think what AI does mostly is that it, it levels up yeah. ourselves, what we, what we expect from a service, what we expect from anything. But if you have someone who's taking pictures of roads, they still have their jobs because there are still going to be people interested in their angle like the recipe, the cooking stuff. In a, in a similar way, I, I was interviewed for a, like a local TV uh, program. They basically talked about the recent like controversy of uh, sport, the, the magazine Sports Illustrated that, that used AI to create fake people and fake articles or like generated articles and, and fake people. And you mentioned that when it comes to an advice it's definitely better to have a human. And so I guess that when it comes to creativity and to opinions, it's also better to have a human. So what, what do you think of, of the, the potential of AI in such like creative purposes of journalism, art, entertainment? Personally, I use AI a lot. I'm a creative person and I have a very creative job. I use AI a lot. I don't use AI to replace the way I write on my content or to try and imitate what I do. I really use it as an assistant. Um, I, I saw people in the AI space doing blog posts and they would just uh, take a, a, a question, then ask ChatGPT to write an article, copy, paste, add two pictures, that's done. Um, I don't think, I, I don't believe in that. I, I, I know that some website got a lot of growth in traffic doing that. And then overnight there was a, an SEO update and then all these websites are good. Um, but I don't think it should be done for that. If you just need an answer for something, you can go to Google, take the first article and get your answer and you're done. Now, if you're writing creative stuff, if you're drawing illustrations or pictures, if you are writing, um, 
stories, journalism, stuff like that. AI is just a way to either rewrite what you have wrote or make it better, validate, uh, proofread it, uh, or maybe just get the facts. Like, can you write a summary of how a convolution works? Give me three bullet points and explain it to a 10-year-old. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you still need to tell it that it should be designed for a 10-year-old and that sometimes I, I use it a lot for metaphors. You know, so before that, uh, before AI, I had an entire book of uh, a page in, in my notion with tons of metaphors and stories that I would keep. And now I no longer need it. I just say, hey, find me a metaphor about in history about uh, how this connects to that. And I want it for an article based on that. And it will automatically find me great metaphors after maybe 10, 15 minutes. And that's what I'm looking for uh, when I'm asking AI some, for something. I don't want it to replace my writing completely. Uh, it's not going to be good. Um, and even if it gets better and better and better, people don't like fake. I think we genuinely don't yeah. like fake. We are repulsed by fake stuff. So when we create something, it should it should feel authentic. And I don't believe AI can be really that authentic. Yeah, I also use it as a kind of a, a personal assistant, just asking to a, a lot of different stuff related to my, for, for example, for YouTube, for my script. I, yeah, I, I sometimes ask it to either rephrase something or to give me a, a very apl uh, applicable and relatable example, or or just it, it's a, a very good editor. Like it, it basically now now we're entering. Are, are they removing the the role of like the editor job? <laughs> Maybe, um, but often it's just like a, a friend that you can brainstorm with, and other times it's someone that mm -hmm. can help you to to yeah basically improve your text in, in many ways but it's and just also generate images or ex external content and it's just a very powerful tool as google is but much more efficient i, I think it's a better yeah, it, it's just a better internet like you can you i think you can find anything you want on the internet it will just take you time to read through all the relevant articles and then find the relevant example and then maybe adapt it a little to your use case whereas ChatGPT basically does all that and adapts it exactly to you just automatically so it's it's a game yeah. of time yeah yeah definitely so if you write articles that are just around facts you you, you are no longer needed but if you write better articles then we, we may want to be interested in reading you uh, that would be the thing yeah Hey, I am interrupting this episode to remind you to leave a like or a five-star review depending on where you are watching or listening. This helps my work a lot. Thanks to anyone taking a few seconds to click on the like button. Let's get back to the discussion. So we, we are talking about using AI for a while now, and this is a concern of mine. Um, I basically saw a study that I, I'm sure you, you know, but they, they've looked into people using uh, Google Maps a lot versus people not using them. And they've seen that when we were using Google Maps, uh, it, it hurts our memory and, and just our brain in general because we, we don't try to look for like signs that we recognize or just practice like which road to take and etc. And I wonder if it is the same for like e e leveraging AI for any questions or, or things that we have to do. And so my like question uh, or, or slash debate is, will AI hurt the human capabilities in general, or is it like purely net positive, just helping us? I think you could be right. Like I cannot drive home <laughs> right now. Like I, I don't know. <laughs> it's probably 10 minutes, but I don't know how to get home. Um, it's, I rely on ways too much. And it's going to happen with AI. Developers will rely too much on it for to code. And the minute AI is not able to find the solution, and that happens. I, I tried many times to debug myself in code and it just, it cannot. It just, in some problems, it cannot. It just doesn't know. It's obvious. It repeats the same stuff. 
uh, because it's been trained on a data set. And so when you are, the, the minute you are very innovative um, or you, you're, you're trying a problem that is a bit edgy, it may not know the answer. Um, then how do you do if you forgot how to code or you, you, your, your brain hasn't been used for, for this too much? Um, that, that can be a problem. And this just made me think of also the problem of, of hallucinations. Do you think hallucinations can be fixed? Can we, we scale up the current systems and build something powerful enough that we can trust it to give the right answers? I think AI is trained based on a data set, and it's about next world prediction as of today. So <clears throat> there, there are two problems, I, I would say, with AI and why it's difficult to trust. And, and the most obvious is not necessarily hallucination that th this is a problem, but I, I don't know about you. I, I saw it much less today than uh, like six months ago. I think it's, it, it, it's vanished a bit. Uh, there are still some issues, but uh, on the other hand, there is still a problem of bias. To, to me, that's like, wow. It, it, uh, for example, um, I was on Notion uh, writing my strategy for 2024 and I wanted to just write stuff, get ideas on the table and, and, and by accident I wrote slash plan uh, 2024 and AI started yeah. to generate text. Uh, I hit enter and AI started to generate my strategy for 2024. And the first thing it wrote was uh, environment, sustainability, stuff like that. Right in the right off the bat, and that's like just like that, you, you kind of see that there is a problem because it's been overtrained for to to answer mm -hmm. about that that the plan for the company is environment and sustainability, and and, and that's not my problem. My problem is like uh, <laughs> it's a different problem. Like every company has its own problems, and and for that, um, if I ask an AI to um, develop my strategies, even with a lot of um, inputs, I would not trust it. Uh, I would definitely not trust it because I know that it has been trained with the internet and that you can find anything there. And I don't just want anything for my business yeah. strategy. I want uh, what maybe 3% on the planet would would validate and that's it. And and um, and so whether it's, it's, it's that or the hallucination, I think there is a point where you have to know when to trust an AI and when to not trust it. And there is a threshold and sometimes people over trust it at, at the beginning. And now it's a bit the opposite and there will be some balance. Um, ultimately, you, you, you want to be careful with it still, even if it's perfect, not making any error. Uh, you don't necessarily know how exactly it's going to help or be helpful. If you need advice, like it's the advice from who? It's the AI, but it's been trained on a million people. So who exactly, is it the advice from, from someone in particular or a group or a forum? Uh, and, and based on the forum, uh, on the way they do their stuff, on their political orientation, it can be totally different and not suited to you. Yeah. And how do you say, I, I guess that, if we keep with like the current transformers, transformer based architecture, we are just doomed to having hallucinations because as you said, it's next word prediction. So it, it doesn't have an, a good understanding of the concept and of, of like things. It, it just knows what's the best next word to say. It's, it's definitely not like, for example, I can right now, I'm trying to, to speak, and since it's not my also my, my native language, it's often hard to come up with the next word. And so I just choose another one, or I, I just skip it, and the phrase, the, the sentence still makes sense, even though it lacks a word. So like it, there's definitely, it, it's, de it's definitely not working as our brain does. And I feel like we definitely need to change and innovate in the AI space if we really want to reach like AGI or something that is more intelligent. And until then, there will definitely still be hallucinations and like very dumb behavior that will keep happening, which I don't think is necessarily bad. 
And in fact, I think it also helps for the question that we talked uh, earlier about for hurting human capabilities. Basically, I uh, since my last discussion with a great guy, Kenji, in the, in the field, uh, he mentioned that to him, AI hallucinations were more a feature than a bug. And I, I now kind of agree with this. I really like to see it that way because on my end, uh, I've been using it a lot for coding or just for, for, for my scripts or, or anything really. But since I know how, how it works and that it can just say anything and can hallucinate, it forces myself to be sure that I understand what it tells me and to double check on, on Google when I can or to double check by asking someone. I feel like it just, this hallucination issue uh, is something that is, like helping us to to retain some independent capabilities to uh, to understand and to learn new things rather than being completely dependent on a like super intelligent yeah. extra thing. Yeah, and actually, sometimes I ask it questions and I automatically know when it's it's wrong. Like I now have a detector. I don't know about you, but I have a detector on. Oh no, he's full of crap here. It's like obviously he's wrong. Um, it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, um, you know, that it's like we, we are trained now to detect these errors because we've, had, we've been exposed to obvious errors from the beginning and now we don't really trust it. And so it's better for us, I would say. Okay, my next one um, is, is related to, to hallucinations and just the data being trained. And it is that similar to journalists, we all have biases we we all have opinions and even though uh, i guess most journalists try to be as objective as possible they still have their own opinion and it's i think it's impossible for a human being to be like completely objective even if you try and so i i wonder if we can remove all human biases from an ai that we trained on on human text do you think or, or on human content at large do you think it's possible to to build a, ne a neutral entity or something that doesn't have biases well as you said there is no unbiased article or anything uh, you see it with the coverage with the the war in israel currently it's like everybody has mm -hmm. an opinion and i think it's it's uh even if you just show to show the facts, the, the simple fact that you choose to show five minutes of that side and three minutes of the other, and so there is two minutes difference, or to talk more about that than that, uh, just all of that is, is bias. It's like it's human decide, deciding, and even if it's equally split and all of that, even that is a bias to represent something as this is equal. So, so it's, it's obviously all biased, and so is the entire internet. And I think we don't even have, I don't see why people try to look so neutral because it's obvious that uh, we are not neutral and we are not unbiased. So if we are not, so I don't say we should all go extreme and say like, oh, this is, like, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I don't know if, trying to be neutral while secretly not being neutral and while trying to not secretly not being neutral, but having no other way than not being neutral <laughs> is, is a solution. We, we, we just can't. So we should try and see like, okay, assuming I am not neutral, what now? Um, what's happening? And how do I make it so it's still a fair thing? Um, so it's in journalism, but it can be just in, in the way AI answers stuff. Um, if you ask it about uh, political stuff, uh, you will see that it's a bit biased. Mm. And if you ask about genders, it's going to be biased. And if you ask about uh, any topic, basically it's going to, any topic that is a bit political, you're gonna see very easily that yeah. it's biased. So um, it's not necessarily a bad thing if you just say it is biased because 80% of the data is like that and just 20 is like that. But if you try and hide it and appear neutral, then, then there is a, a mistrust issue. Yeah. And 
is it possible to have it like such a, an intelligent entity identify whether things it learns are biased or not and to figure out to not be biased like i guess everything is in the data and data distribution and, and, and etc but since it has opinions yeah that are definitely skewed on the, towards one side but it has all opinions so maybe we can it can just tell you where, where, where it comes from like you know like in, in the new update of gpt4 what they do is they, they show you like we are browsing this website and, and that is great that we yeah. love that because automatically we know now, if it tells us this it's perfect i think everybody is happy with that we know we, we say oh okay so this is why i have this answer um, so explainability At first, I did not think it was such a big thing. We were saying, okay, so we have black boxes and we just have that. That's it. Uh, why spending so much time trying to explain the result? But I was in a very self-driving car scenario where I would say, I don't see a point in explaining why we classify this as a stop sign. Uh, it's a stop sign. We have the features. Just move on. And, and now when we are in this level of AI, um, It's, it's no longer the same thing. It's, we need explainability. We need at least source of where does this sentence come from? My master's thesis was in explainability in computer vision. And so I, it was just an interest of mine to understand how it could classify things and it could understand. But I also didn't see any, really, any real use case of why did it understand that a cat was a cat? Like it's, it's not really relevant it was just interesting to me as a as a researcher but llms definitely change everything like it's it's super easy to to see that we want to understand why it says that and, and why not like for example if we if we talk with a, our friend or our family we and and we ask them for for an advice or something we may question like but why why not do that instead and th they will give like experience or uh, examples or or like where They, they learned it from and if we trust the source or, or whatever we will trust them so it's it's just the same for uh, llm sharing knowledge it's all about trust um we want to trust it and so to trust it we would need uh we would yeah. need transparency that's exactly related to the uh, the interview i had yesterday they asked me why was this such a, a a big issue like it, it went viral that uh, a big magazine used ai to generate articles and fake people and that's exactly what i said i think that the main issue is what is that they lacked transparency like they didn't say anything and they they just tried to to fake it and, and just that it wasn't spotted and the articles were good like they, they were Not, I, I don't know if they were viral, but they were being read and people enjoyed them. And I think like there's no issue with AI having generated a good article. Like if the article is good, it's good. It's irrelevant who wrote it and what wrote it. But I think what's relevant is like saying this was automatically generated or this was made by this person. Like they usually credit the author, so why not? like say that it was automatically generated i think yeah the, the main issue is with transparency and and trust as you say i i completely agree with that because people don't want to lose the credit of their work it's like uh, let's say i make an illustration for my course with ai i spent two hours doing it i, I did not just write make an illustration i had to review hundreds of different ideas, I had to change it, I had to, uh, even after post-produce, uh, add, add, add algorithm output. I, it's more like AI is helping. So we should write maybe done with the help of AI or something like some, some little icon or something without it being like it's 100% AI generated. Or maybe we should have that distinction Rather than just AI versus human, having AI, humans plus AI, and humans. And so, and so this way we would better understand and people would be more inclined to say human plus AI and everybody would be in that category. So there would be no shame in doing that. 
uh, if we do that, maybe. Yeah, I, I had the discussion with uh, the VP of editorial at Hacker Noon, which is a platform to share articles, and and they they were in the they were going to add tags, specific tags for like AI generated or AI edited articles, but not forbid the use of AI. Just like be super transparent that it was either generated or edited with artificial intelligence and i think that's just that's just perfect like if someone doesn't want to do to, to have like any ai thing in their feed they will just like unclick that tag and have only human written articles as long as everything is transparent i think it's completely fine to to use any help to me i, I when right when, when it comes to writing uh, not automatically but you I see using AI as just as using Grammarly or a, a friend that has like good writing skills to review your work. It, it's just an external help that helps you see your own writing differently and that can suggest things to add. For example, I, I recently shared a video on why I quit the PhD and on my initial script, I sent it to, to ChatGPT and asked like, uh, basically ask what did it think and if I should add anything relevant or like how how to make it better basically but I I, I still put it as a list and, and try to have more specific feedback but one of the feedback was that it seemed to have too much things <laughs> against the PhD and maybe not enough for the PhD to share basically what I enjoyed w while doing it because I really did enjoy it and I, I still do enjoy it I, I just think that it's not for me anymore and that I want to do more real world stuff, but I didn't like share it uh, clearly enough in the, the initial script. And without this help, this external AI help, I would just have shared maybe a very like negative video about the PhD, whereas it was not my goal at all. I, I, I still think it's super relevant to many people, just not for me. And so anyways, I, it, it was like, amazing feedback to improve the, the quality of the, the video and the value of it. But I would say it, it is biasing you to go neutral. And, and I would say, for example, like uh, two days ago, I was, I was launching my course on BirdEye View, uh, which is a, a way when you have self-driving cars, you look at, you know, with the image and you have vehicles and all that stuff. And then you just want to have a BirdEye View from the top so you can like have the understanding of the context and all that. So we use that a lot in self-driving cars. And at some point, uh, I'm ready to write an email, the last chance email. So, you know, I have a series of emails. I send maybe uh, five or 10 of these in, in a short period of time where I'm going to send stories and stuff about BirdEye View and people love reading them. And, and at the last chance, so what some people do is just say, Hey, last chance, buy my stuff. And I wanted to write a story about a plane taking off and people just m not missing the plane. And so I wanted to have the story between some kind of general and, and, the, and the assistant or, or someone like that, and then have the general being super angry that the assistant wanted to leave now and not wait until midnight, which was the... the the moment the, the course would close. So uh, I don't know if you follow, but the idea was basically, I wanted to do some kind of mean stuff where, I, where the general was super angry and say, we are going to wait for every single one of them. They have five minutes to join the course, blah, blah, blah. And, and the, the AI, what Chad GPT told me, uh, oh no, you should not say that. You should uh, try and make it happy about the idea. Of, and I was like, no, no, I just wanted that. That was funny to write that. I just wanted that. And, and I ask it like three or four times to rewrite it so that I could have that. And, and, you know, I like when it rewrites some paragraph because there is the details and all that stuff. And in the end, it could not. So I just wrote my own thing and published. And, and that was like, uh, I was against the AI. I wanted to be mean and he did not want me to be mean. Uh, so so that, that can happen too. Yeah, I... I see how it definitely puts things more neutral or like uh, friendly. Yeah, I guess it, it did change my article, but I also like basically my whole thing is that I wrote a video on 
on my PhD, like this summer. And I never published it because after, after a few months, uh, after this writing the script or like a few weeks, I, I was starting to think of quitting. So I never published the video about the PhD and what I liked about it. Yeah. And it's, it's just to say that I did have things to say for the PhD and it just reminded me to, to that it's, it might be important to highlight some of it, but I still, it, it's not like a half and half video. It's still definitely more on the, on the plus side of the startup world and like all the things I do, yeah. but still I, it, it gave me like really good uh, cues on why it would be relevant to add like uh, this thing or, or, or this thing. And I, I felt like it was, it, it's also good to cover both sides, even if you are for, for like more for one side, but I can see that you definitely need to be careful, especially if you want to like for some humor or, like more opinionated thing you definitely want to maybe not take into account all it says because it's definitely like politically correct and biased towards yeah, like it's all like i write a lot of emails so obviously i wrote like this morning i wrote email um a thousand and a hundred so um so imagine in a thousand and a hundred daily emails i often give my opinion i, I often say stuff that is politically incorrect. And I want that. I, yeah. I want because that's honest and that's transparent and that's me. And if I ask the AI to just verify every single one of my articles uh, or my emails, they would always be very neutral and so very boring in a way um, because people like also, I'm convinced that if you did a video 100% against the PhD, that would probably, in my opinion, be more interesting. And then maybe you can do one for the PhD. But, you know, when, when you're not like, when you're saying what you mean and you're not just hold, held back yeah. by, by something, what you write is often better. I don't know. Sometimes when I do videos or write emails or stuff, I have two modes. I have the fury mode when I just say anything that goes to my mind. And then I have the, the okay mode, the thing that is okay. It's like, going to pass everywhere. And, and always the fury written email is always better. It's like, wow, we want to read that. That's interesting. That's engaging. We want to answer. We want to give an opinion. And the other is like, okay, so I have the good. I have the bad. I have the summary. Um, I have the explanation, three bullet points. That's good. That's informative. Uh, so it depends on if you want the information, yeah. the fact, or like really the, the human side of it. Yeah. I have two last uh, question ish to to ask. Um, basically, in my case, it's a bit different for for the first one because my my father really likes what I do and artificial intelligence, and he's interested in learning about that, understanding AI, and he's now even using ChatGPT instead of Google. But other people like my mother or most of my friends do not use ChatGPT and I assume this is like the easiest to use, but they still don't use it. And so what do you think it will take for like the general population, such as my, my mother or friends to, to use artificial intelligence? I have the same parents as you. So my father is like, uh, he, he, he loves ChatGPT and sometimes he, the other day he's, he told me, uh, we have a dal. Uh, there is a DAO now, <laughs> and, and I was like, so it's in yeah. French, but the, the word DAO is like, he, he just wrote, and I was like, what's a DAO? He said, yeah, that's incredible. And, and that was actually DAO E, the, the image generator. And, but he, he was so excited about it, and he was using it, and he was changing his website, <laughs> and he was trying stuff like that. And my mother, I think she doesn't even realize what that is. Um, but but, but what we have is if we want my mother or your mother to use it, first, we would need a good reason for them to do that. The reason you and I use it is because it's solving a problem for us. That is that we need to go through 50 websites just to get an answer of something. My mother does not really have that problem. She likes going through some website and that's okay with her. She doesn't have a content creation job or anything like that. So she she's fine with it. Uh, She's using AI when she's watching Netflix and using the recommendation yeah. system. Even if she doesn't know it, uh, this is what it is. Now, maybe at some point she will ask AI for some answers 
but it would need to be like Google is trying to do when there is, you know, a, a sidebar and there is the AI answer. Like that, maybe very embedded, yeah. uh, almost invisible, like we don't know it's an AI, then it's mainstream. Uh, if you cannot tell that this show is being offered to you because of an AI, and even on Netflix, the illustration is different based on who is looking at it, then that's mainstream. Yeah, I, that was my exact opinion of it needs to be like extremely well embedded in the platform that they already use. And... I feel like even if it's super ChatGPT is super accessible it's just a chat but a chat box like you you can just write anything and it it will answer it's still another application another thing to to subscribe even if it's free and to to go on to 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 look for things whereas I assume that just just, just like Siri for iPhone I guess like if it if it asks if you if it becomes more intelligent and uses AI, like it, it does, but if it is just become better and better, people will be in fact using AI just by using their iPhone. So just just like the autocorrector, I guess if they make it like more and more AI based, yeah, invisible. Yeah, I think it's funny because we want it to be transparent, but it needs to be invisible <laughs> to the user. Yeah, <laughs> and and I think also there is this idea of you know the, the hype cycle and. Um, so maybe we've been with ChatGPT early yeah. adopters and our fathers are the, the middle that joins right now. And there is also like my wife now is using ChatGPT to ask questions. Um, and three, four months ago, she did not really know what that was. And, and maybe then there will be the late adopters that will just like, it's just going to be too obvious not to use mm. it, too accessible to like first solution offered versus searching the web. Um, automatically present on every website like the chatbots are right now when you join a website and the, the support is now chatbot based you, you can have that um, and that will yeah. make the late adopters join uh, uh, it's a random thing but on my end I managed to convert my girlfriend to use Midjourney for gen generating oh. <laughs> images <laughs> but that was like before Dali 3 and I, I need to get on your level and and teach her to use ChatGPT or like when to use it. <laughs> yeah, and Mid Journey is actually yeah. also good. The, the only thing is that you cannot, at least for now, you, you cannot really use it to write uh, to, to to you cannot write to it as you mm. would like to. Uh, I don't know if you've tried ChatGPT with Dali, but it's really amazing when you say just change that to yeah. that and it's going to work. And, and the other, you need to, to, to write some weird keywords. Like I use the keyword double exposure a lot. And so it's a keyword when you have two images at once. So if you say a cup of tea and uh, a garden and double exposure, then you're going to have a, a cup of tea. Like no, maybe not that, that, but an eye that is also a portal. And then you have the double exposure of like you have the eye and also you have a portal to something else. You know, I, I'm using that a lot and. I don't like to use that word. It's like, it's complicated to, for me to think of it. And there are, this is the only word I know. So I, I use it <laughs> everywhere. And there are millions of words I should learn on mid journey. And, and I just like every update makes it more yeah. difficult to use and to think of. And there's just too much. And I think you either become a, you can become a, a pro at that. But at some point, they're going to catch up on yeah. GPT, and so that's going to be useless. Yeah, I really like what what OpenAI has done with Dali three embedding it in in ChatGPT, and now it just like reformulates all your prompts based on the the what you ask, but also the conversation before and etc. It's 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 just amazing. But yeah, so my last uh, question is, um, I think personally that. Con uh, to the contrary of what we thought before, AI was said to like increase the gap between poor and rich by like allowing the the rich people to better control like everyone else, everyone else. And now, from what I see, of course, it helps like companies make more money, but it also democratizes a lot of stuff for anyone and I see it like at a personal level that it allows me to do much more than I could and to learn way more things 
and a lot of other people that do not have access just because it's free. So it's like you can use it to, to build stuff and to do stuff you never could before. And so my question here is, do you think that AI is helping democratizing more things, more industries and tasks? Or is it more benefiting the big companies and the, yeah, the, the richer people or both? I think, I think um, it's funny you, you talk about that because I was looking at something the other day and it was about rich versus poor and versus accessibility of stuff. And it said that basically in 1953 in the US, we had about 1% of, person of people that were very wealthy, uh, 4% that were financially secure, 15% that were completely able to retire. So you're like 20% is incredibly good. And then 80% is like uh, struggling, mm. a bit broke, almost broke. Uh, they consider themselves like very middle class, humble, all of that. And in 2012, they run the poll again. So that was 1953. In 2012, they, rolled, they, they run the poll again. And it was exactly the same answers. Like, even imagine everything that changed in 50 or 60 years, everything that changed, it's all much easier. Um, it, it's all like be, before that to, to just like for me to run my job in the 1950s that like other than the idea of self-driving cars, just teaching innovative stuff to engineers, yeah. that would be crazy. And, and now I, st- I have all this potential, all this AI, all this stuff. And we still have the same ratio of rich versus poor versus middle class versus that, versus that. We still have everything the same. So I don't think that more access to more information and, and more access to more tools just close that gap. I don't, ju- just looking at the data, uh, and unfortunately, we, we don't have, uh, we still have like 20% uh, being extremely wealthy and, and the other like struggling and, and probably we will have that uh, with AI as well. I don't, I don't think, I don't see a reason why this would change uh, because with everything that we had in the past, uh, it did not change. Like internet definitely allows us to create some kind of product more easily than like physical ones. And likewise for artif- artificial intelligence, for example, if you just can code right now through using English rather than learning uh, JavaScript or, or whatever, it's also making it more accessible. But would you say that ultimately it's still, I guess, like the the distribution of people that are more entrepreneur versus entrepreneurial versus others that like I don't know that follows like school and the the more uh, traditional path? Like, is is it because even if it's more accessible and and, and easier to to build something? They just aren't willing to do it. And it's just based on like the human brain. No, it's more like, it's more like AI is not here to make you rich. It's, it's not here for that. Um, you, you don't get rich by using tools or by using uh, more access to more information. Uh, you get rich by mindset. This is like, I think most people who are, poor or who define themselves as poor um, is of mindset. It's like the simple idea that you use the word poor versus, I would say, broke. It's like there is one that is temporary and one that is eternal. Like poor is like, I'm poor. That's it. If you say I'm broke, it's like I'm temporary struggling and I will get back. It's all mindset and it's all education. And so... That's probably what we would need to work on uh, rather than um, like education with money, with, um, with, with how to uh, see yourself in the world, with how to see yourself learning stuff. That is, is I think, um, more important in making. And this is why like in my emails, uh, I'm writing a lot of what people call career emails. And, and I'm writing a lot of that, like how to negotiate, how to build your resume, how to do that, all the, the mind stuff, 
not really implementation, but more like uh, you should see yourself as valuable, yeah. all that stuff. And, and people are like, hey, I don't want that. Like, get off with this email. I oh. just want the, the, the hardcore technical stuff. Give me that, like, like the occupancy network and the 3D stuff. Just give me that. Don't give me the career stuff. And, and, and they realize later that the people who study the career emails and implement them get much more results than the people just scrambling for every possible article on a technical topic. Because that's the mindset that produces the result. That's the idea of, I understand uh, how to position myself versus another pe person. I understand how to say no, when to say no. All that stuff is incredibly valuable. And we've had a lot with personal development where, where people, I think it helped a lot of people. Um, but, but I would say it's like much more efficient and a bigger reason of people who could become rich by their mind than just knowing how to use another tool. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I guess that like everything is okay. in how confident you are. And that's just like, there are many studies that just confidence is sexy, basically. And and just, yeah, it, yeah, it, it allows also, I think just by being confident, you you tackle more and you try things you think you couldn't do, even if, if even if you personally think you you cannot you will fail if you are confident enough you will still try and like worst case you fail and that's yeah i think that's where the the power of mindset as you said uh, lies is it just allows you to push more and do more whereas if you are not confident and you you just yeah i guess that if you if you lack confidence you will you will just try to do less and you you will give up before it succeeds just for example in my case i i wouldn't say that it's like a, a big su success or, or whatever, but uh, my YouTube channel works. And after it's, I think it took, I don't know, like at least eight months or more to get to my first thousand subscribers. So before that I had like, I don't know, be below a hundred views per video. And I did two videos per week or one, like sometimes one, sometimes wow. two per week for eight months before it gave me anything. And that's mostly because I was fully anonymous. I didn't use my real voice. I used the text to speech instead, and it was extremely low okay. quality. <laughs> so it's it's like very bad. But and and I I didn't want anyone to know that I was doing that, so I, I didn't share it. So that's why it didn't have any reach. But still, I consistently shared and I tried, and I I just I don't know why, but I knew that some someday it would work, even though the the quality. Like looking back, it's it's just, it's horrible, but I I saw people doing AI generated courses, and and I still have the same opinion. It's like, why would you want that? Uh, it's more like I'm not sure. Like I mean, maybe for explanations, like you just have drawings and you have arrows, but even there, uh, it's better to add the human face and the smile and, and yeah. all of that. Yeah, I think I also preach when 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 it comes to learning, I preach to to learn with uh, multiple modalities. So basically, like learning through videos and just live events, or writing your own thoughts, or reading, like just all the different types of ways you yeah. can learn is is very beneficial. And just just reading an article that is AI generated without fun facts that is what you remember, like for from high school or whatever. The only things I remember are the fun facts or the the things, the cool things that their teacher said. So, stories. Yeah, just, yeah that's yeah. definitely useful. Uh, yeah, awesome. So, is there anything you would like to share with the audience? Um, I think we covered a lot about what AI is and what uh, more than what AI is. How do you deal with an AI world um, if you are uh, an engineer or? Anyone who is like, either you feel threatened by AI or you just don't understand how you can use AI. It's more like what we discussed. Maybe it would be worth to maybe read the transcript as we discussed multimodalities. I think when you read stuff, it's much better, especially interviews. Yeah. Like when I read interviews, it's amazing. Um, and, and when I just listen to them, it's, it's also good, but I think reading adds a lot. Um, and try to think over this concept of, how can I really be valuable in, in this society? Like, 
am I just giving the fact or am I giving my entire self? And, uh, and of course, if you want to learn more about self-driving cars, uh, Luis will give you the link to, to, to join my emails and, and read them. And, and these are free and you can join uh, on thinkautonomous.ai. Yeah, I definitely recommend, recommend it. And the link will be the, the first one in, descrip in the description. So yeah, oh, thank, thank you, you very much for joining me. It was a very fun and nice discussion. And I'm sure it's helpful in many ways for various people. So yeah, thank, thanks a lot for taking this whole hour and a half to, to chat with me.